Uncharted is a popular video game franchise that you may have heard of. Uh, and a video game franchise that you, John Bellamy, may have worked on at Naughty Dog. I, a couple times, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you spent a few yeah. years. Yeah. You, you moonlighted a little bit. Yeah, actually, uh, th this year will mark my 10-year anniversary at Naughty okay, Dog. Okay, yeah. yeah that means I've had my hand in every single Uncharted game yeah, that yeah. we've put out. Absolutely. And that's uh, been, you know. It's been a ride, a, I'm sure. It's been just an amazing experience. Yeah. Um, Long-time uh, Giant Bomb viewers uh, probably remember you from a handful of E3 shows over the years. We've yep. had you kind of... I hang around, can't get rid of me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Come in, drink, drink all the beer. Uh, but yeah, yeah, we've had you come in and like kind of drop some tech knowledge here and there. You're a programmer at Naughty Dog. So yeah, I love kinda, the Gab Tech. Yes. Uh, well, that's exactly why I brought you in here, because I love to awesome. pick your brain about it to probably... To excess, okay. Ad nauseum. We're gonna make you an SPU programming expert by Excellent. the time we're done. Okay. So ready your dot products. Oh, oh. new cross products. Okay. How's your linear algebra? I got. No, I'm trying to okay. pull from the jargon. Well, I got right. nothing. I kept my schedule open, so this should be, <laughs> this should be good. Uh, yeah, like yeah, you're you're a programmer. You've uh, you've done all kinds of different engineering work on all four Uncharted games, and I think yep. it would be fun to just sit down and kind of you know. Now that the series is done, you know, like like yeah. you guys as a studio have very firmly come out and said, like, you know, we've had our time with Uncharted. I know, and it's it, been a great time. But like, you know, Nathan Drake truly is sailing off into the sunset, and we're yeah. gonna look into some new stuff. Uh, and it's I nice it, for me to look back and just yeah. like reminisce about like yeah, like this, 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 how far we've come and like totally. all the stuff we've worked on. Yeah, yeah, and like you know, we'll we'll get into it here in a second. But I you know pulled out all my copies of the old games and like just went one after yeah. the other looking at them. I was like, man, this stuff has really come a long way. Um, but uh, without further ado, let's uh, yeah. hop right into uh, Uncharted 1 here. Oh, uh, yeah. This is pretty early on in the game. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so if, if I remember correctly, you got to the studio while this was... Yeah, so I started 2006, um, which was about halfway into Uncharted uh, 1's development cycle before it was even called Uncharted. It was just called Untitled Naughty Dog Project or Project, Project Big. Okay. Uh, was the internal code name? That's, all right. All right. That's got um, that's got some some oomph to yeah, it. But we had just put out wait, 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 wait. that E three, uh, like showcase demo okay. of like kind of like a stylistic like uh, showing of what we wanted to achieve with like that's right. With we, the gameplay yeah. and like the flavor and like yeah, we we do that that game tapes premium feature where we're going through old B roll and yeah. we pulled up the Sony press conference. I from, saw that. And I was like, I was I remember that. I, I guess was, that was oh, that was, was two thousand five. I guess it was or was that 06? That would have been that would have been 06. The, the 06 E three. The year before it came yeah. out, the game came out. So yep. yeah, that's right. They showed like. Here's footage of Drake running around in the jungle punching people, yep. but I, but it didn't have a title on it at the time, and I was nope. like, wow, they revealed that game before it had a name. That's uh, we just wanted to show we got Naughty Dog doing something that we think it's could be something special. That's a, it's a studio with pedigree that people might be interested in what they're doing. So so yeah, mm -hmm. so you came on. Obviously, uh, the first PS3 game that the studio worked on. I guess also yes. your first PS3 game. My very first PS3 game. Yeah, we had just gotten um, I think the final form of the. Uh, dev kits. Okay. Uh, and uh, I come in, and then, like the the first thing they tell me when describing the PS3 architecture is, we need to make the SPUs do as much work as possible because they are just amazing yeah. processors. So, so my understanding of the PS3, and this is a layman's understanding, but right. uh, also I will try to keep moving here as as we go and not just stand still, but. Uh, is that you know the PS3 was a very CPU oriented machine like you know it had a GPU but all the real horsepower was in the cell and yeah. like we had the RSX GPU but then like the PPU uh, main processor which was hyper threaded for like two core two uh, worker threads yeah and that, that's uh, what people would think of as a traditional CPU that's right basically yeah like very similar to uh, what you'd find in like you know other risk based like machines um, the thing that made the PS3 the PS3 was the uh, six or seven, depending how you counted, the SPU processors that um, were attached to it, and I guess it's called like the SPE, the 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 SP Info. Media Engine, or something yeah. along. Some one of those like fun acronyms that engineers like to come up with. Sure. But basically, yeah. it was a collection of these super powerful, um, like no nonsense math coprocessors, almost right. that attached to a, a ring bus uh, yeah. to the. Um, to the PPU and to main memory. So, so very highly specialized for crunching numbers, but not necessarily for running generalized code. Is yeah, that, is they, that the case? they are designed to like 
do like basically like math as like a factory. Yeah. Right. So you want to do you want some fucking math done? You need call it the you, need, you just what? have like just like an endless Sorry. flow of math, and yeah. that's basically what video games are. Right. Then you these things were designed to like really solve that problem. So they didn't have like a lot of memory. They didn't. They had only. I believe 256k of what we call local store. Right. So just kind of a small, so small stream you, of numbers in, numbers out. You give it like a, here's a small like working set of data, and then like the the processor just from the grounds up like no nonsense, built to just crunch that data and then spit it out. So the thing that complemented that was the just blazingly fast like memory DMAs that you could do to get that in and out. And so all the work became like, okay, how do I take this problem and chunk it up into data sets that are small enough to fill in the SPUs and then organize all my memory DMAs so that... Uh, oh God, it, I should not look at you while I'm playing this game. <laughs> Sorry. So you could like solve like whatever it is you're trying to solve. Like, yeah, like, okay, I need to like, you know, come up with some animation blendings or like some navigation path finds or uh, 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 the ICE guys would use this for like uh, like mesh processing. Yeah. Um, ICE, ICE is kind of like your in, your crack team of internal like yes. tech specialists. ICE, right? is, ICE is our special forces programming squad. Yeah, elite. We have a little, yeah. SEAL uh, Team Six of, yes. of Naughty Dog. And yeah. man, having them in the building was really great because I, and they like my, them constantly. I get my understanding is like their work ends up sort of filtering out to other studios as well, right? Yes, like, that's that is the idea. They they solve sort of all the hard problems and then we uh, disseminate that knowledge to all the studios that we can to like. You know, help them make like the best games that we can. Right. Hopefully, make them look as good as this lovely shot. So, are you? I mean, I know this this game is what nine years old at this point, but are you able to look at a scene in this and kind of like have a sense of like, all right, here's what different SPUs are working on in terms of simulations and and, <laughs> and like shader type stuff. Oh or, yeah. Like, I mean, like, well, so like the first Uncharted, like we were really just getting our hands on the platform. And do if, I want to make this jump? I, I think we've talked about this in like in GDC talks in the past, uh, where. Make this jump. Like the amount of maturity in our engines jumped drastically just from one to two. If you were to look at a profile graph of what's happening right now in this scene, you'd see most of the SPUs are, you know, idle, just not doing really? anything. Really? No kidding. Yeah. So there's like a ton of like untapped the, horsepower. There was a ton of untapped horsepower. Uh, I mean, obviously, you know, if you look at the game side by side, you're like, yeah, yes, two <laughs> looks significantly better than one, but like it's. But well, we were just trying I, to. Figure that was not a jump I should have made. <laughs> Sorry. That was a jump you could not make. Yes. Uh, yeah, the uh, we were just trying to like figure out like a, a a way to architect the game engine and like to have a, a game frame that could like go through all the stages of you know doing your game logic, your game rendering, getting it out to the GPU in time. Like that had all these basically new dependencies on the SPU jobs that were now part of the process. Uh, so. Once we got that in order, like things really took off. But for Uncharted One, it was mostly just like getting our just like come come to grips with this hardware, getting getting our feet wet with um, with that architecture. So, uh, our uh, our physics programmer Sergey, he um, came up with this really awesome uh, uh, utility that we ended up that helped us a lot in the, in the very early days of our SPU programming, and it was basically SPU emulation on the PPU processor. So you'd have some bit of code that was like okay, well, like. Here's like you know, let's say like a physics solver that we need to um, you know run as as like multiple jobs on the SPUs, uh, but you know debugging SPUs is harder because it's like attached to a different processor and like managing like breakpoints and stuff. Yeah, like it I, was I, more like is it was more difficult. And if you could have like the more familiar experience of debugging just like more basic PPU code, then yeah. Like that would okay. help for people like I'm writing in. gameplay code Crazy. or whatever SPU jobs that need to happen. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'll, I'll just cut in here real quick and say that like I, I've had a fascination with your your work and and specifically like a lot of the the like random facts that you can spit out pretty much as long as you know all the years that I've known you. But I feel like one of the early things I remember you telling me was talking about that like the arrangement of the SPUs on yes. the cell. Yes. And like you know for people who write machine code maybe this is like this is old hat but like. At the time, this was years ago, you, and you said like you kind of need to worry about the physical layout of, of, of where the SPUs are and like yeah. passing data from one <laughs> to the next and making sure that things are moving in the most efficient way and stuff. Yes, like, like it sounds like it sounds like a mind-bending problem. When you get when you really start pushing the hardware, that is something you do have to concern yourself with. Uh, we're on we're on the SPU uh, ring bus. There's the SPU that you're actually running on, you know, lay. So that might affect like your memory timings for. 
and, and thus your throughput of whatever workload you're trying to do. When I first started at iDog, they uh, sat like all the programmers down uh, with uh, Mark Cerny and uh, Dave Simpson, who was the head of ICE at the time. And they basically gave us like our first introductions to the SPU architecture and things like the memory bus and things like the DMA and like the caveats that come with it. Like besides like local stores, pretty small. Um, so you have to manage your memory. DMA is pretty fast, so that helps. Branching on the SPU is like if you have to make a decision point about like, okay, do I do this thing or do this other thing? Sucks. Like the branch penalties on the SPU is not really what it's, you know, built for. It's built to just churn through data. Mm -hmm. So we would have cases where uh, you'd in, right, you change the way you solve your problem. That instead of like, okay, I need to either do this work or this work based on this condition, to instead say, okay, I'm going to do both sets of work and then just pick the one I need. Interesting, because because so, it's it's le yeah it's more it's more, it's less efficient to pick one job or the other than to just do it's, both. And it's then much more uh, and penalizing the, to and discard the the stuff you don't need to jump to do what's called a jump in, yeah. in the program counter yeah. to to execute different parts of code huh. than to just execute uh, uh, all the code at once and do what's called um, a select, mm -hmm. where you can select based on a variable to say like okay well then just give me this one or this one. Um, yeah, SPUs were arranged in um, a, a, a dual pipeline um, fashion where you could actually execute both. You can actually execute two instructions at once per clock cycle, or like tick two instructions at once per clock cycle. So you had what's called like high instructions and low instructions. And so not only like do you have this job of like making your assembly Cozy. like really work in normal assembly you know uh, terms, which is itself pretty difficult, pretty arcane. And now yeah. like you add this extra dimension, like okay, now you have other column where you can fill in with other instructions and that should ideally be doing as much work as possible. Yeah. Um, so uh, when, when you did get that working well, like the results were astounding. So take for example like Drake's animations here, like when he's like running around. Um, the animation trees for that are fairly large. Like we do, we throw a lot of different animation clips at Drake and blend them all together in various ways, like give him the sort of like naturalistic jog or the leans or whatever's going in. And have one action transition into another without looking super jerky. Or right, and so yeah. blending that on top of other ones and the the um, the core of it was some, a module called ice animation. And ice animation was like basically the SPU jobs that took all those clips and then did the math to like, you know, get their joint values and then blend them all together and then spit out a target pose. It was so good at just chewing through those clips that when we would have bugs where some degenerate case would happen of like, oh, some logic of like, what animations do we need to add to Drake to gotcha. make him look like this would run away with it. <laughs> and he would have like, Sully, you're not gonna like this. over a hundred like different animations blended on top of him at once. Wow. And like, it was so much like the, like the, the debug display on the screen, it would just be com run completely past it, both off the bottom and off to the right, because it just, it, was just so much actual animation. Just, and ice animation just like, just chew through without dropping a beat. The only reason why we knew something was wrong is not because like the frame rate tanked as it would normally. It's just we just, oh, we drew his anim tree and like, oh, <laughs> whoops. <laughs> just trying to do everything at once. Yeah, yeah, so ice animation, like we really felt like just unrestricted in what like that could do for us in terms of character animation. And that was, it was really exciting for something like we'd like, you know, coming from PS2 games where you maybe had to consider like, okay, well we only can do like a handful of animation clips. Right. And if you have to blend multiple states, then like that's like, you know, like the crossfading problem of animation, you can only do so much. Right. That's I, know, I know you weren't there uh, in the PS2 days, but do you know, coming onto this project, do you know how much, if any, uh, tech made it from like the, the Jack and Daxter stuff into this, or was this a clean slate from, so, from the get-go? Um, Jack and Dexter, we, and I think in Crash as well, I'd have to check, but uh, we did all our development in a language called Goal, uh, which uh, Andy Gavin has talked about uh, a lot, and like yeah, I know who you are. some of the uh, you know more senior members at Nidalog will remember quite fondly. Uh, but uh, it standard for, was it game-oriented like assembly list or something along okay. those lines? Basically is, is a list based um, assembler, essentially. It was a list-based language where um, 
it was really powerful in that you could just like write a bit of like code and then the core of the engine could just reload it dynamically. Mm -hmm. And the iteration times for like all the Jack games were super fantastic because of that, because you could just like, okay, well, I need to like change the way like this, um, this plane like, you know, modifies its router or whatever, or the way this enemy AI interacts with, uh, with this set of circumstances. And like, to see the results in, in like moments. Like, just like, just, yeah, just type it in like, in, in like within seconds, see the results up. It, it was sort of this beautiful like amalgamation of like what we consider normal gameplay code and then like gameplay scripting. It was all kind of one in the same. I guess scripting like just to, from a, a lay perspective, like kind of a higher level, uh, like a little bit more right. obvious to a, a non. It uh, is, um, yeah, kind of like a less skilled program, or you know, like designers can take it's a advantage much of scripting. Scripting, scripting technically or traditionally is like a much more simplified interface right. to the game engine, and like right. the, the things you can manipulate with scripts are basically dependent upon like how much work your engineering staff is exposed right. to people who are writing the scripts and supporting all that stuff. Basically, ends up being this another layer of execution that has to happen. Wow. But it allows people that aren't like programmers by trade to to. But you can devote, do some kind of custom design stuff yes. without without like taking your time. Basically. You can lower the technical bar to content creation. Yes, and yes. that was that's the, a good way to put it. That was the big big win with uh, yeah. the streaming language. And so the legacy of Goal and Lisp at at, at Night Dog is that while we did switch to C plus plus for PS3, oh um, because we didn't want to rewrite all our tool chains for this, and there was a lot of it. Um, we did keep our scripting language to be uh, Lisp-based. Mm -hmm. It's um, uh, named DC, which I believe is called like, Data Compiler. There's a treasure up there. I just saw that treasure. Damn it! Uh -huh. <laughs> Going back to these games with my like eight and ten-year-old saves, I've seen several <laughs> treasures that I missed the first time that I really want to go get. But I think I may have. Well, maybe I can still climb up there and get that one. Uh, anyway. Um, but yeah, uh, DC was uh, our, our way of like um, retaining a lot of the institutional knowledge we have about uh, Lisp, or in this case, Scheme, which is like a variation of Lisp. So kind of maintaining process and, and, and workflow type stuff? Or just, well, having people, programmers who knew like what they could do with such a language. Um, like we wouldn't be able to really give something useful to designers in terms of a Lisp-based language uh, until Uncharted 2. Uh, but uh, Jason Gregory, uh, one of our lead programmers, one of the first things he did was uh, take a, our DC, um, DC basis of uh, expressing stuff in Lisp and write a uh, what we call an IGC scripting system. Uh, Sorry, IGC I was just, is just uh, looking for the treasure. <laughs> I didn't mean to interrupt. In game cinematic. I think you want to get on top of those pillars. And, ah, let's move on. <laughs> It'll be there. Uh, cover them. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean to cut you off there. Yeah, IGCs. Uh, the, so we use that a lot, and there's a um, uh, a Jeep chase sequence in here that was like kind of our big test bed for that whole scripting process. Um, yeah, it was a way of it was like, like our first foray into like. Having stuff that, having these moments play out that weren't just like, okay, here's like the hard cutscene line. We can actually do something a little more in the world, in the space. And uh, we only got more ambitious from there. Sure. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty, a pretty technical abstract uh, con or, uh, topic to try to have a conversation about and also play a Just game imagine a lot of parentheses. Yes. And then more parentheses. Uh, let's, uh, let's go ahead and switch uh, to the next chapter, uh, which we, we talked about a little bit before we started this yes. thing. Uh, I feel like that chapter was kind of a good showcase of like, here's, here's what Uncharted 1 looked like in terms of, you know, some, yeah. some nice vistas and, and... That's one of my favorites. Uh, just also aesthetics. Uh, and then I'm gonna stick to easy just so we can keep this thing moving. Um, but uh, this next chapter is, it sounds like, was kind of like you guys, like, major test bed for this game. So every game, it always has, like, there's the one level where you end up spending most of your time. Yeah. Because, like, we have to, like, bring on, like, all sort of the fundamental building blocks of, like, what goes into this game. Just from basic movement, the movement of the enemies, the, you know, the shooting, 
Is, it, is that typically determined by like you know the design elements of okay this level heck has kind of has some of everything that we're doing. So if we get it all working in this level, then if that, you're lucky, that, yes, that trickles yeah. that trickles down yes. to all the other levels. If kind you're of lucky, if you're not lucky, then like you'll, a level come on late that is like oh we need this like big new feature that we don't <laughs> haven't actually been able to implement. But uh, this one isn't it isn't it a producer's job to stop that from happening? Mm -hmm. So that's the thing about Nidog is we have a very flat uh, workflow uh -huh. structure. Uh, we don't have a lot of internal producers, uh, so it's it it's more demanding that you. In, in the sense that you have to like keep up with like all the departments that you're interacting with and managing your your workload, mm -hmm. but the ability to flexibly work from one task to another, or mm -hmm. to like see needs that need to be met and just be able to go meet them. Right. Um, it, okay, so it was the it was the biggest sh shock to me. Yeah. Coming to Naughty Dog. I, I didn't know that about your studio, and like for people that don't know, like the in a in a video game context, like producers generally are the ones who like. Set people's schedules and like say, okay, these features need to be delivered by this date, yep. and like kind of prevent, you know, each each discipline from kind of getting disrupted by the others, right? Yeah, like different producers can have different jobs depending on the company. It seems like right. it has a sort of a wide yeah. set of interpretations. It's, it's, it's a little bit fluid. Yeah, um, but. but in in my experience, like they, the not so great producers would in, ultimately just like be like a source of friction, and. The, when my, my friend Marshall uh, joined Naughty Dog just before me, he said like, oh, this is amazing. Like I can just like talk to like an artist or a designer and like we'll figure out like what we want to do and I'll just like code it up and, yeah. it, and, it's, and it's in and, and, it and it's, it's there. And that's it's like, that sounds like engineering nirvana. Having, like, as a programmer specifically, yeah. that was something that really appealed to me. Having, having worked at a, a startup, granted it was for a web-based thing, you know, mm -hmm. but having worked at a small startup with a bunch of really good programmers like that you could mm -hmm. just walk up to and say, hey, we need this, and like half a day later, here it is, you know, like I can understand the appeal. Yeah, and we, um, we love like, you know, solving that kind of stuff, assuming it's not too crazy. It's a, it's a very like invigorating way of, of, of working and getting things yep. done. I, I, yep. I've been lingering here just because when we were messing with this before, you were very happy with how wet he can get here. Oh yeah, and in fact, I didn't notice like you were saying, run under that waterfall to get him wet. But I actually see that it just like creeps up the pants, like only yep. as deep in as I've gotten. Yeah. Like, so the way this works is there's a UV mask on Drake's uh, clothing textures that um, we um, have a, basically a world space to UV conversion coded into the game so that when we detect you know certain points below the water line, then we can translate that to a UV line. And then in the case of the waterfall, we just say, fuck it, do it all. Uh, he was very wet. He does get can, wet. I like can, that was, I yes. Yeah. And some moist drake. Uh, what was I gabbling about? I, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm honestly, like, I'm interested in like anything that catches your eye here just as we go through this so, stuff. Like, <laughs> one of the first things I did um, when I got to Night Log is, yeah, uh, like I said, they still didn't have a name for the project. We were still very much figuring out what this game was, um, right down to the shooting. So my first task was, we need to figure out a way to make shooting work. So we think we're going to try lock-on shooting. Huh. And I implemented basically like uh, the, the spinning triangle lock-on, um, like automatic shooting. Uh -huh. like, there was no actual like third person aiming at that point. Really? It was literally just like. It's just gonna be like run around, lock on the You stuff, hold like, aim and it just snaps to whoever's there. Yeah. And then like the accuracy would tighten in. Um, no kidding. And, until you like you had the shot and then shoot. Like, because we were trying to figure out like, okay, well how can we make this sort of like demo that we made? Ah, yes. <laughs> we just have to pay just, a moment of respect to the six yes. axis here. Whoa. <laughs> yep, yep. So I mean, was it was it apparent pretty quickly? Like, like oh god, speaking speaking of the devil, like we're gonna need like some active shooting with real aiming in here. Like, I think that might have lasted a few weeks before it got replaced with something else. Something I noticed playing this game, like uh, you know, obviously combat design not really your thing, but like, oh, uh, I put this on easy, but mm. this game on easy plays probably harder than yep. like modern shooters on yep. default difficulty. Yep. <laughs> like you still die in not that many hits uh, on this mode. Like it's it's kind of eye opening. Yeah, but when you've been playing for like you know a year and a half, like you, it's easy to get you know. Really, just sort of intuitively build up those skill sets, and so the really hard part is um, coming up with the difficulty setting that you know is divorced from your you know 
built-in expertise that you come from developing the game. Yeah. Oh, I flubbed it. Let's try it again. Come on, Drake! Oh, that didn't go well at all. Happy time. All right. <laughs> I swear I did that on the first try before this. Um, let's try that one more time, maybe. Seeing that toucan, it reminded me, I was telling you, the, the, the amount of uh, technology that we're still figuring out when we're making this, like, it's evident just in this scene because what you see now are three different animation systems all running at the same time. Really? Yeah, we have one animation system that drives the player, one animation system that drives the NPCs, and uh. then like say that toucan bird or oh, that's these these trees, or for example, that's like the what we call the object animation system, which was kind of like a it was like a simplified wrapper uh, on top of just ice and almost. Um, and is that because all those things have different needs? Or was that more of a, like, we're still getting our feet wet with this platform, like, this is... Yeah, so, I mean, in, in, in classic engineering, like, everyone, like, like have their, they own their own specific needs, so they come up with a problem for their needs. Um, and then, you know, we very quickly realized, like, okay, well, we can't keep supporting, like, like these things that almost do basically the same thing. Uh, we need to, like, get them in the same house because, like... We do want to benefit from the fact that, like, okay, well, if the player implements some, you know, nice new feature, then, like, the NPC should be able to get it as well. Uh, and, and it should be robust enough and fast enough that, like, you can have objects animated in the world that it will, uh, you know, do it without tanking your frame rate. Um, but, you know, getting the first game out, getting on the new platform, like, that's... We saw that and we acknowledged it and it's like, okay, Uncharted 2. And Uncharted 2 is where we did, uh, you know, get those animation systems. Uh, down to just one animation system. Come on. You know you're going to do it there. Oh. Yeah, the uh, player animation system had a very um, uh, convoluted, or let's say elaborate um, way of uh, scripting it, um, which wasn't DC-based. It, was, it used something called computables, mm -hmm. which is a way of tying information needed by animation scripts into the game engine so that you could, uh, it, as a programmer, very intuitively express like, okay, this is like the slope the player's running on, or this is like, you know, how much he's breathing or, you know, how much damage he has. Um, things that would be keyed off of for like com coming up with different animation blends. I guess, is this something that, that was becoming more of a concern as things like feet and foot planting? Like, you know, kind of like having having legs interact naturally with surfaces and stairs and stuff like that, like like you're kind of gaining the horsepower to actually worry about stuff like that? Or? Oh, yeah, yeah. This, this seems like this was kind of the era that that was starting to happen, right? Yeah, like the just coming up with ways where we could procedurally determine like oh which clips we should be blending at all times. So like the breathing is a good example of that because like the, if you like run around in circles for like, you know, five minutes or something, you'll see like Drake is like doing this sort of big heavy chest movement. And that's like a, what we call an additive animation playing on top of his chest uh, that we scale down from values that we run in the code side that can can drive like based upon like okay well, we we want Drake to like recover after so long and this kind of thing right um, so nope. not even just doing like like sort of post steps of like doing IK on the body after we animate but like within the animation itself having more fidelity when it comes to like coming up with clips to play based on Factors and environments and conditions and stuff like. <laughs> he was just waiting. What a jerk! Uh, yes, they do. They do uh, know if. Oh, they aim, actually respect your aim. They yeah, because we track where the player is aiming at, and they will not uh, okay. come out of aim, cover if you're actually aiming where they are. Like that is the classic stereotype about cover-based shooters, right? You just like wait for them to just pop their head up. But yep, not so much, huh? Uh, I don't. I don't know how much more you like. Like like you were saying, you know. I mean, obviously, this was the first game the studio did on the PS3. I don't know yeah. how much more you want to get into here versus like what I consider the main event, which is the next game. <laughs> um, is there is there anything else you'd want to look at? Should I push forward a little bit more here, or you want to go ahead and move on? You already did that stiff fine. I oh boy, I'm that. totally getting shot from somewhere. Uh, what else are we talking about? I mean, like, yeah, this... Just so much of Uncharted 1 was just, like, the learning process right. of just the like, hardware, the platform, like, you know, getting our... Getting our um, technical house in order and yeah. um, 
like kind of like the first Uncharted had to happen so the subsequent Uncharted's could happen, right? You know, it's funny um, because when people like ask like, okay, well, like I want to get into the game industry, like I want to like you know work on video games, uh, and they ask, like, well, well, what should I do? Like, and usually it's in the engineering context, so I just tell them, okay, well, 3D math is important, so write a ray tracer. Uh, but I, I, I say write a ray tracer not just because like 3D math is you know um, really important to that, and ray tracers are a great way to learn 3D math. But oh boy. the importance of just finishing a project, uh -huh. um, just finding just, just finding a goal and pursuing getting oh getting God. to the end of the project, just so that you you can deal with all those unknown problems that would have uh, come up yeah. uh, in the process of just like putting a, a bow on something. Even a small something, it, it it adds a lot, and it really informs you a lot about like what it is you're actually dealing with there, and the, the, just the process of getting Uncharted done taught us so much about the platform, about like the game that we want to make, like what we thought was fun, you know, what we thought we wanted to do better, yeah. and um, just left us like clearly chomping at the bit to like, okay, like we've we've. We found our footing. We we think we can really hit our stride. Yeah. And, yeah you know, it's, it's not that this game wasn't impressive at the end of its day, but also, you know, it, it was the first game that, that you guys. I mean, did. it was it was ambitious. It was. Um, I, I I still. Uh, I look at like the like when you guys did the game tapes, the uh, the announcement trailer that we did when it was still unnamed, and I remember just feeling so excited about like man, like these. These guys are really, really smart. Yeah, like these are some really smart programmers. I, I was just in awe of just like just being in that same room. Yeah, just trying to soak it in as much as I could. <laughs> just get it while you can. Yeah. yeah, and seeing like what like okay, well, what can we like do when we really just put like all these really smart heads together and like and I it was a it was a proud moment for me. Um, sounds like a heady time. A lot of a lot of stuff happening very quickly. Yeah, like we were just throwing ourselves at all kinds of like new and interesting problems, and uh, seeing like like when we'd come across some like oh well, we can actually like do this, and then hey there you go, I got a treasure. More than halfway there. Yes. Okay. Yes, this has all been worth it now. I got a treasure that's been sitting there ungotten for the last <laughs> ten years. Uh, eh, nine nine years. I guess this came out in 2007. 2007 uh, yeah. yeah, let's let's go ahead and pop out here. Yeah, uh, there's a couple more neat little kind of tchotchkes here. Yes. In this game, before we move on. Yes. Um, that we can dig into in the menus here. This is my favorite one. As, as far as you know, this has never been discussed outside of the studio before. I don't think so. Uh, so I might get in trouble for this. We're not going <laughs> to tell people how to do this. So at least that secret. You can take to the grave, but right. But to set it up, like when we were like putting the final steps on uh, Uncharted, and we were doing sort of a last-minute like analysis of like play testing feedback and stuff, we weren't set up to really get a lot of good information out of the game when this was happening because we were making basically final discs for submission mm. in terms we, of like how people were playing it and like what the yeah, yeah exactly we wanted data to aggregation. We wanted to see like okay, well like like we saw them play it and we saw how the enemies were behaving. What did the game think was going on? And so we have a system called, we call the DDA, which is a dynamic difficulty adjustment, I think. Mm. Um, and so in here... Uh, and this, and this, is, this is in addition to, you know, there obviously there were three tiers of Yes, like even, even within here. like a, a, a selected difficulty, with, with some exceptions, there is variations that can happen um, to things that affect the difficulty of the game that we will try and scale based upon like the player's performance. And these are happening dynamically, like just as you, from fight to fight? Yeah, okay. With, within moment to moment, it, yeah. is, it is like accumulating this information and, and trying to make a, a good analysis about like, okay, well, how can we make sure the player doesn't get too frustrated or feel like it's too easy? Like right. we want to try and hit sort of this target level of um, engagement and, you know, and enjoyment, yeah. ultimately. So in terms of like, you know, like how much damage enemies take to die and stuff like that? Yeah. Right. Right, so to help inform us, uh, if you go into a certain menu here, yes, and you hold a certain button combination, well, which let's, yes, there are buttons involved. Let's say there is a button combination here. Uh, watch for the pixels yeah. to appear. <laughs> there's a slight 
pixel shift here. If you see, yeah, so so in this case, it's directly to the left of subtitles on the menu there, yeah. like that little kind of like lighter colored area. Yeah, so if of you that let, bar. if I let go here and then it yeah. goes away, and you can see like, okay, well that's that's where it was. And basically, what that represents is within the window of dynamic difficulty, where does the game think you are as the player? Do? Right. And, the, and this and is kind of, this reflects like the last chapter that you just bombed out of, basically? Basically the current state of play. Like where I player. just left off? Yes. And is, is, so. that, is that vertical line, does that account everything from easy to hard? Like, like if, if that were all the way at the top, would that indicate you're I at the top of hard? Or, or? I want to say yes. If, okay. like, if you're on crushing, it would just be all the way at the top, no, right. no adjustments at all. Okay. So, so, so according to this, I was like right at the... You're kind of in the middle, right? Yeah. At the, the, the so, medium. like, it, it, it might have like felt like you maybe you deserved a death or two. Yeah. And so, okay. let's say it absolves you of okay. any, any of that. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, we're gonna let off the buttons again, so you can see that thing disappear. That's neat. Like, that's such a tiny little thing, but it's so cool to hear it's, that yeah, that's in there. One of those things that we're just like trying to like squeeze like every last moment of development that yeah. we can out of it, um, and just tell us more and more that we can. Even if it's something that we can't take into this game, is something we can do. For the next game, yeah. So, and then you were, uh, oh yeah, you were going through. I don't know if you want to look at any of the studio <laughs> photos or not. I'm sure those are, are fun. Yeah, to see. that's the water garden where we worked uh, from back in the day. So yeah, I, I actually took some of these pictures because yeah. I was going through, you know, photography phase. There's right. Shaddy and Neil and uh, very excited Bruce there. Oh no, yeah. kidding! Wow, yeah, huh? yeah. That's yeah. I've heard of those guys. <laughs> yep, it was back when he was an uh, art director on Uncharted Four. No kidding. And, and, okay, you know. Impressing everyone all around. Actually, I didn't see where. Which floor was Neil? Uh, go back one. That's Babyface Neil. Oh wow! Yeah, look at that. Yeah. Huh. Those guys uh, moved up in the world. Yep. Um, but yeah, so so that obviously shots of the studio. That's are cool. that's the programming department. This uh, this right here. That one. That's that's where I spent most of my time. You okay. can see me in the uh, on the right there, uh, Chavis over my shoulder. Okay. Making sure I don't break the build. <laughs> uh, and then that's. Close-up shot, but yeah, that, that's me working on that uh, swinging wall rope mechanic was one of the first uh, uh, things I got to uh, play with uh, and, and get, get working here. Yeah, um, yeah. the uh, designers talking with Dan about the scripting, you know, and Christoph. Yeah. A dog. A Pogo! A naughty dog. Oh, we miss you, Pogo. <laughs> nah, he looks like a good dog. He's a very good dog. Good dog. He loved your trash cans. Gross. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> Yeah, we had some fun decorations. And foosball. Yes, good, yeah. important. Uh, but the stuff I really want to see will kind of flip through here. Yeah, I had fun shooting this well. Uh, data center. So, if you go back to that, like uh, we were, we were the last holdouts when it came to the um, Linux tool chain for. Uh, uh, PS3 development, and we had we, all our compiling was on on these big, just big beefy servers uh, we called compile dogs. Yeah, um, and yeah, like you you did say compile dogs. I just want to. Okay, no, that's that's great. Yes, <laughs> that's great. Yes. We can go. We're all there. It's like yeah, com, <laughs> compile one dog, compile two dog. <laughs> yeah, like it, and like that's uh, those these were Linux machines set up to take our like. Let's say involved build pipeline and just churn through it at, you know, with as many cores as we could shove into a server, and it was glorious. Just yeah. having that much compile power at your fingertips, it was really, really fun. And uh, these two guys here, they they helped set it all up. That's yeah. Justin on uh, on the right, and uh, and Charles on the left here. That's our that's our IT support. That's okay. Man, just rack mounts on rack mounts. Rack mounts. I love looking at a rack mount. Uh, yeah, there's, there's something to it for sure. Yeah. Um, there's some cool stuff at the end here. I'll, I'll, I'll flip sure. ahead real quick. A lot, of, a lot of the team photos here. Team. But, uh, yep, there's you missed me. Wait, did I go back one? One more. There it is. I'm, hang on, I'm looking. There's my peoples. Yes. Uh, early mocap. Obviously, you know yeah. you guys have gotten pretty pretty heavy into that stuff. Uh, series has been around for a while. When you look at this stuff, you're like, man. <laughs> yeah, it's been, a, it's been a journey. It's been, it's been a ride, but uh, it's, uh, it's, here we go. The feels. This is what I was looking for. Speaking of feels. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> this guy's definitely feeling something. Yes, so uh, <laughs> these, like both of these, like uh, 55 here and 56, these, these are uh, a fun class of animation bugs that can happen um, when you 
misinterpret an animation clip. Um, I mentioned something called additive animations mm -hmm. earlier. Right. And these are so basically that's the, that's the blending, basically, right? Well, an additive animation has a different meaning in terms of the data itself. Uh, an additive animation just represents a you you offset a joint. You don't position it absolutely because normal animations you say like, okay, I need the wrist to be here, mm -hmm. like uh, fixed in space. You right. can't see. I'm holding my hand up. Uh, but an additive animation might just say like, okay, well just move it to the left 10 degrees or something. More of an incremental thing as yeah, opposed so, to like keyframing kind of stuff. So then it can ha work potentially with a larger set of uh, different animations. Like it's like you move your arm a little bit for a variety of say idle poses or something. Mm. If for example, you were to take that additive animation which says, okay, you need to like, you know, move it just a little bit and interpret it as absolute positioning, uh -huh. then you would have this sort of singularity effect where Drake collapses Got into it. like okay. this tiny little ball. It's like taking taking the same value and putting it in the wrong slot, or, or well, it, or, or yeah. giving it a different meaning, effectively. Yes, and yeah. in, 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 uh, an extremely different meaning. Yes, in this case, a um, a facial additive looks to have collapsed his face into his skull. <laughs> uh, I hate when that happens uh, because the in this case the reverse happened, where the additive animation was interpreted as a partial, uh, and. Uh, well, yeah. yeah results, it, it, the, the results speak for yeah, themselves. Either you get like the singularity effect or uh, you get the sort of explosion giraffe limb right, effect. Right. And uh, yeah, it's it's good times. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so there, that looks like the breathing animation I, I talked about earlier um, got interpreted. Maybe it was missing it. It tried to do bind pose, but did bind pose as partial. Uh, yeah. It, <laughs> That's, yeah, is, there, there's is, your giraffe effect. This is horrifying. Yes. All of this is a nightmare. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. I think I've seen all this, I can see. This, this is horrifying. Move the slider all oh. the way up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. Well, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a fun little look back at Uncharted 1. Yeah. Uh, which was, you know, like we said, the kind of the first thing you guys cut your teeth on on this platform. But uh, let's uh, take a quick pause and move on to the... Uh, I think the, the the big sure the big moment for this series <laughs> she doesn't seem to like it when I point the gun at her <laughs> she might take umbrage ah. <laughs> how many <laughs> how many SPUs are involved in her threat avoidance <laughs> system Just one angry one <laughs> So yeah, like man, moving from from Uncharted one to this is just like holy crap! Like when you play yeah. them side by side, it's like yeah. You know, I, I certainly remember at the time how just gobsmacked I was at, at all the things this game did so well, but like seeing it side by side, like holy crap. Uh, you know, like you could quibble about like frame rate or re resolution or whatever in this, but like this still looks really damn good. <laughs> like this holds up, you know? Yeah, obviously we're playing the original PS3 version here just because like that's kind of, you know, that's what we're here to look at, but yep. this makes me, I haven't, I've got the Nathan Drake collection and I haven't actually fired this game up yet. Uh, but this makes me really want to see it, yeah. You know, with with that stuff improved and like see how yeah. well it holds up. Because Blue like, Point did a hell of a job. Yeah, I, like what yeah. we went through getting Last of Us on no, the PS4 architecture. Cut uh, like, the hotel a different and way. they did that three the times over. <laughs> you, you, you can <laughs> I, 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 I got mad respect for those guys. Yeah, they they, they really um, yes, I do. They, they, yeah, they pulled it out. Yeah. This way. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, no, certainly no disrespect to any other games in the series, but this is the one. Like, holy crap, man! When this came out, it was just like everything kind of like crystallized here. It right? was like, I mean, I may be a little given to hyperbole at times, but like playing through this game back in two thousand nine, like it like literally dramatically expanded my notion of like what an action game could do. You know, like it was just just one thing after another playing through this thing in terms of like the way that environments are like like falling apart and 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 feel like active and alive you know and yeah uh and like that is very much a, a goal of our game is we wanted to just make the worlds feel like more alive with like you know the way they could respond to you the, the way things could move just yeah. like from that like swinging little line up there to like the things you shoot over right like it's uh we did a much better job of filling up our SBUs <laughs> work to be done on this game. And Start taking advantage of that untapped horsepower. Yes. Um, yeah. And and animation was a big consumer of that, and not just like animation for the characters, but uh, just animation uh, for th everything that we wanted to have any kind of like life like life giving motion. Sorry, this is a this is a tough tough moment to ask a bunch of questions. Yep. Oh God. 
Let me just dispense with these guys real quick. Uh, but yeah, like this is, I mean, this is the start of like the chapter, you know, I feel like if you're going to point to to one yeah. moment in this game. I mean, obviously, you know, it, it was uh, it was on stage at E3. Like, people people remember this moment for oh, sure. Oh, God, that E3 demo. <laughs> like, so, yeah, I don't know how much you want to talk about that stuff, but I've heard <laughs> it stories. Was, it was so nerve-wracking. So nerve uh, uh, yeah. The... Right up until, like, the night before, like, I'm... Like, I'm there with Evan, just like, okay, I'm making sure the run through works, making sure this guy hits his mark, just hit his mark. That's all I need to do is just... Just be there so that Evan can like knock him off the building and then like show how cool that death animation was and then I promptly pass out. <laughs> so I'm done. That go. was like, my E3 is achieved. Go home I, and sleep for I, a week. I can sleep now, yes. Was that, I mean, so that, that build came in hot, it sounds like. It came if in pretty hot. If yeah. you were there the night before. Yeah, my understanding was they, they yes. We, Took advantage of our LA-based location. I was, I was just gonna say, like it's, it helps being able to drive the build across town, right? Yes. Um, let me uh, let's get through the end of this fight here. I was talking to my wife about important work texts, and I told her if I get an important work text, that means something's on fire. Yeah. And it's usually related to a demo build. <laughs> yeah. That worked. See all those guys thought you were over there? And then I'm pretty sure. Oh, there's like a last known position thing going on. So I rewrote the perception system for this game to uh, uh, basically track last known position in, in a better model. Um, just so we could have more moments like that where you could get the drop on the line. Right. Um, and we would we'd push that further with Last of Us and try and do more stuff when it came to like you know, in, inferred acquisition and, and awareness of that kind of stuff, but just being able to, you know, lose a guy and then get the drop on him, uh, that was, that was fun to write for me and, and I think it, it helped a lot for the game just in terms of the combat. You, you um, have less scenarios where it just seems wholly unforgiving uh, when it comes to like enemy awareness of you just because like, oh, the Raycast pass, so now he knows where you are. Right, kind of thing. So, was that the kind of thing where, like, I mean, did you have any reference to work off of there, or was that just kind of a, we know conceptually what we want? Now it's time to engineer how the actual solution is going to work. Um, it was. We had some Flourish things here. that we would say, like, I would, we call it inspiration, but like in, in terms of like an absolute reference of like, oh, this is what we want to model yeah. exactly. Like, no, we were trying to figure that stuff out for yeah. ourselves and. Uh, we were just kind of experimenting with like, you know, values when it comes to like, okay, well, we need to balance like the responsiveness of their perception with like the ability for Drake to like, you know, make them look like fools, but hopefully not idiots. <laughs> make fools of them. Right. Uh, without totally neutering them, yeah. Yeah, AI is one of those really tricky things where it's, you, you don't want them to actually be perfect humans. You want them to be fun punching bags. Right. Not from here. So stuff like this. Yes. Very resourceful. Uh, you know, like in the first game, like we saw some of that just now. Um, like it was a lot of very obvious handholds, you know? Right. It's like there's a lot of very convenient climbing surfaces cut into these rocks, you know, versus stuff like this, where the things you were interacting with in the environment felt so much more organic. All right, I'm in. Uh, and like they blended into the design, you know, a lot better. Like I don't know how much of a challenge that was on the programming side. One of the things we did, versus uh, like which, art and design, but. which was really helpful, uh, was we would we start keeping track of places where the player would jump and then not actually grab anything. Is that like just in play tests, You mean? Like yeah, just in normal development, like play tests, and then like you know internal testing as well, uh, uh, just like us playing the game. Um, but like if you imagine like the player like standing near a wall somewhere and he sort of does that jump but doesn't grab anything. Yes, that that that, 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 that is limp, that, is, that, that is a failure at some point. Yes, right? that I mean, limp, impotent jump where you think you can grab onto a right. thing but you can't is like the bane of this game. Yeah, and so it's super informative to be able to like you know have this essentially a heat map of like places in the level where players are thinking they can jump. Mm -hmm. For some reason, so did you guys actually generate those maps? Like, oh yeah, you had that and, data, and then then we fed it right back into this game, and then yeah. we were able to like refine like what the environment looks like, you know, and uh, you know give 
like stronger visual like clues, right, stronger floor. camera clues, like every aspect of it uh, would of go it. into like trying to, you know, uh, Great. Sounds like one of those cases of, of find that. yeah, of like you know different departments working together of like you know like you guys are generating this usage data, right? And then artists can look at that and say like I need to put some yellow highlights here because that's where a person needs to jump. We're or whatever, working right? with designers, we're saying like what tools can we like give you to like figure out like these problems that we need to solve. <laughs> but yeah, like you you know as as you you know I I, I kind of already swung through those those flagpoles there, but yep. like. Bits like this are where you start to really get uh, a sense of like the scale of these levels and how right. big the draw distance was, and just like how crazy the amount of detail was, mm -hmm. like even far off in the distance. And mm -hmm. then also like here is another little moment of like, as you move up this thing and the camera swings down, and it's like, oh, that's the thing I need to swing on. You yeah, know? It's I was like, talking about with like the camera cues, so right? Trying like, like give you something like a, a little more nuanced with like guiding the player. Right. Like, like not everything has to be yellow necessarily to draw your attention to it. It's like, you yeah. know, this this was a great early example of like you can use things like the camera to, you know. Yeah. And then you'll see that's in super... three like lighting becomes even a big part of that right. as well. So yeah, I I don't know if th that E3 demo started like right here, but it's I think that was yeah, it was at the top of that roof and then When in doubt, jump on the yellow stuff. This is where stuff starts to pop off. Yeah, so like this is this is really it. You know, it's like the camera angles start changing very dynamically, and then things like this start happening. Yes. And like you know, granted, you guys are like taking control away here and there, mm -hmm. but like it so seamlessly switches back and forth from like. Yeah, we never want like, you to feel like you were out of it. Like you're right. still like present in whatever like nonsense. In right. The bombast. Like stuff like this, you know, yes. like it's. At the time, like there was nothing like this. Like it was completely insane. Yeah. And I'm certainly curious from a development yeah. perspective, like how you implement all this stuff. But it's also <laughs> going to be hard to ask about while I'm trying not to get my ass killed here. Uh, well, um, a large part of it is the cameras, right? You want to be able to have certain scripted cameras uh, that trigger based on, like you know gameplay events like you landing on that thing and being able to have a robust camera system that can sort of blend in and out between like all kinds of different camera modes and stuff. Um, we run, call it a run camera stack. Um, Down here. And, and manage that in a way that has all the right interfaces that we need for like in terms of like designers being able to push cameras, like cameras that can follow splines, you know. So it's things like that can leave like the framing in the way that you want, like how Drake was sort of left framing on the right side there, so you, you know, give that classic Mario cue of you need to, you know, move in this direction. Right. So it sounds like that's some mix of designers like hand placing behaviors they want and, and like kind of algorithmically making things happen. Is that? Uh, it's a lot that? of designers just doing a lot of like work to get that stuff placed in a way that you know feels good. Um, and like communicates the, the right information. Like things like your combat camera and stuff, that's a little like where more, where more algorithms can play in because like you can't really control for that from the right. scripting side, but you know like that sign's always gonna fall down. So right. you can, you can um, polish it up into a way that looks like really nice. Whoa. Whoa. So yeah, like this kind of stuff here. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I have to imagine just in terms of the physics that were going on and like the environment deforming and stuff, like you're working the hardware pretty hard at this point. Yes, yeah. There's a lot of uh, things happening. <laughs> Once here, as the entire this, level this, is crumbling yeah, around this, you. This physics-based platform is also like you know moving all this stuff on here, which right. the enemies are also navigating on, but still getting like whacked around by death. Right, like and stuff. The, yeah, like they're trying to still kill me, even though they're getting yeah. flung to and fro like ragdolls. Like, like that stuff still looks impressive, you know. <laughs> like seven years later, this is actually still like it totally holds up. Yeah, that not scripted. That is just like the just a bunch physics. of just a bunch of systems interacting there. Yeah, because like you can't really control where those deaths are going to fly, but the enemy needs to know like he can't walk around it or he can't walk through it, so he has to walk around it. Do you have to worry about constraining? Uh, I don't know, like values and stuff, to make sure things don't get too outlandish. It's like we don't want these desks to fly too far. Oh sure, that they sure. look too yeah, crazy. Yeah. That you have to kind of rein it in a little bit. Yeah, like you want to like give reasonable values. You don't want to like because so much of uh, how physics is modeled in video games is a simplification, and then when you introduce simplifications like that to like actual physics equations, you very much get the rock in a hard place type situation that can lead to 
things like your chair shooting off with infinite energy because right. of, like that collision wall ain't moving. Maybe you dispatch these guys and we can go talk about the train. Oh, Which sure, right, real, yes. That was like the big, big thing with uh, this game. Was really? Just yeah. in terms of challenge? The, in, in, in the engineering effort and... Uh, no kidding, because like, the, you know, the, the, that's a, this is obviously also an impressive scene, but obviously this is the one that people saw at that E3 yes. that were like, oh like my the god, The top team building game. used the technology we developed to make the train system work. Okay. Uh, in a way that was... I don't know if we anticipated initially, but man, it worked out really well. Because the whole... So with the train, like... Should we kill the helicopter? Go for it. Give a shot here. Oh, it's very easy. You should have a very easy time That's not doing work. this. It's, you do have to lead it a little bit. That's not going to work. Mm. <laughs> I think we're going to have to move on. I totally <laughs> killed this thing before this. Let's move on. What do you say? <laughs> so is this FMV? Is this like an, a movie file playing off the disc? Uh, I believe so, yes. And you're kind of hiding level loads behind this stuff. I saw, I've seen people speculating about Uncharted 4, like, which, how much of it is, how much of it is, is a movie file, and how much is just, like, the PS4 actually makes it look that good, like, it, it seems like people are more mystified than ev ever about which parts <laughs> are being faked and which parts are, are actually the game. There is very little faked. Really? At this yeah. point, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it, that is our engine, you know, tortured into submission. <laughs> Bend it to your will. Yes. So yeah, you know, like like as far as standout sequences in this game go, it's the building collapsing, and then it's, you know, from a programming standpoint, this was the one. I was, yeah, like I was going to say like run, running, jumping, and fighting on a moving train with right. a bunch of like uh, terrain scrolling by you at a thousand miles an hour. Because we were talking about the train like level early on, and we we're like trying to think like, okay, well, could we do like sort of like what are the like standard sort of tricks you can do to like fake a train moving, which is like moving backgrounds, but the fixed train and that mm. kind of stuff. Yeah. And we realized we, we really want to be able to feel like it was naturally progressing through like different levels. And that's really hard to do with moving backgrounds. And we also want you to progress like not only like from where you start in the jungle side, but you eventually end up after coming out of the tunnel right. into a different type of into the, the snowy mountain area. Right. Different and type that of is um, that's really hard to do yeah. if your thing isn't actually moving. So we said, OK, well, let's see if we can just make this moving platform thing work. And our answer to that was a system we call bound frames. Uh, and bound frames are a way of representing a location with an implicit um, attachment, a way of saying like, okay, Drake's position is here, but he moves with this object. And just being able to say like, okay, you can no longer think of Drake in sort of what we call world space. You think of him in parent space. Like he's not like moving like, 60 miles an hour with this train mm -hmm. he is just he's actually somewhat stationary on this train car and then you know the train car figure out the rest and then if you ever need to figure out well for purposes of you know whatever what is drake's actual world space position all this stuff would be computed just in what's called a lazy fashion like it would just be lazily evaluated that we won't figure out his world space position until you ask for it and okay. then we do the math do the actual world space transforms for it at that point uh Determining like okay, well, where his uh, real world position is. Yeah. But what that allowed us to do is we converted all our systems that would normally operate in what we call world space to just be pure parent space logic. So we can say like okay, this NPC he generates a path from A to B along this rooftop, and it's all parent space pathing. He just he does a path on the train car, and then the train car just figures out the rest. So the, the train car is is what's moving. Right. And what's taking place on the train car is stationary with is, respect to the train car. Is right. That? It is an actual true frame of reference okay. as opposed to trying to do this thing where like we figure out like, okay, what was the train car's movement at this frame? So this train is actually it. moving is what you're saying. This train is actually moving at this speed and yeah, it it it, it was um the the first big challenge was like I said, converting everything to work in the same what we call like three D space right. uh, of parent space so that they could all reason about like, okay, well, you know, I need to aim here to shoot 
like Drake if he's like standing here and that kind of thing and figure out like okay we'll just get in like path results back and like following that kind of thing um, and things like all right well now you have because we, we, we break up our um, objects into buckets and so the the train will update first and then NPCs will update on the train because uh, the train lives in what's called the platform bucket okay um, but I think I'm following you we still have to account for we still have problems like say like this guy who's like walking around, he's shooting raycast down to figure out like, okay, where should he plant his feet for leg IK? It's a nice flat surface right now, but we had bugs where to say if he stepped, let's say, too close to those crates, uh. like in front of them, if the raycast were a frame behind, now his raycast weren't hitting the train car where he was, is, but where he was, uh -huh. and like his feet would just shoot up into the air, standing in the middle of nowhere. Fun bugs like that. Yes. Yeah. So. I'm idling here intentionally because I'm curious, like, what would happen if I just let, the, like, will this train just, just mm -hmm. run infinitely through this same environment as long it's as gonna, I sit here? It's going to run through, I believe, a fixed set of environments Okay, here. so all, so every environment or every bit of this environment that it's going through is, like, hand-built and exists it's, and will yeah. repeat? You will, you will start to see, I Like, is, it just, is there just a, a seamless transition back to the beginning at a certain point? There will become, there's, there's like, a f like, fixed points where we can branch. Branch really? The, branch the train also, so even if I let it idle for 10 minutes, it's going to appear to be somewhat varied and not just the same thing? Well, no. Oh, I mean, you're like, talking like about branching once, to the next once environment. You, once you advance in the okay. train like gameplay Not uh, Not different wise, versions of this then environment. Then you can move to like, the it. next set of environments that represents like how far you are, which is how we do, say, the um, the mountain tunnel exit into the snow area, mm -hmm. because the mountain is, is right, just there yeah, like okay. living. And then when okay. you get to like the boss battle and the helicopter is ready to show you, like you get that nice reveal with the right. snowy mountains and everything. But this, but this jungle environment will just kind of repeat uh, yeah, as it, is. It's it's running through like a number of set pieces. Gotcha. Yeah, okay. it, and but it is like actually moving through that environment, and it is uh, doing it at a speed that makes uh, a lot of assumptions you make about programming gameplay systems much more challenging. What a kidder! I think he was waiting for you. <laughs> it's almost like somebody decided <laughs> to put him there. So how how late in development was did this stuff come together? This I mean, was the like, first thing we, we tackled. Oh really? Okay. This was, was this, like we knew like this is gonna be like our hardest problem. This is one of those yeah, we right, need to figure it out. Right. right it's now. like it like if we can't get this done, then we can't do anything. Because so much kind of, of like what we want to achieve is predicated on our, our ability to like, you know, construct these like set pieces that have these moving platforms. Right. And then I guess kinda getting this done sort of enables you to then go and do then you can Whoa. take this tech that we did for training and say, make a building fall over. Right. <laughs> I see. And that's fucking cool. Yeah. Yeah, it seems to it seems to have been an <laughs> idea with some legs. No, that that is, is probably the one of our most long-lasting technical legacies in Uncharted is yeah. the bound frame system. The way we can actually make moving platforms work. Um, it, it's... It's in our code base to this day, and in a way that is like we found like just useful, robust, and like you know, uh, it's still very good. Still paying dividends. It's a very basically. good tool to have in your toolbox yes. to have that kind of thing. Like you know, whoop, want to go there? I don't think so. You're dead. Bring it on! Oh, and there goes your dead. Wondering when the obstacles are going to start coming <laughs> in my face. Not quite yet. You're, you're getting there. Oh boy. That's not a place I want to be. Roll, roll, roll. Nope. <laughs> didn't happen. <laughs> didn't get there in time. All right. Well, I, you know, I guess that kind of gives us a, a good primer on on how this stuff was put together. I have a, uh, a a test level where I do a lot of my sort of like local work with like you know NPCs and stuff and. Because like this, this part, this set piece, then all the tech that went behind it is so important. I ended up putting a, a flying like Hogwarts style train ah. in my test level that just sort of flies in the sky around a loop that I would always be able to use to do my. Uh, okay, well let's just like spawn some enemies and see how they can manage like you know, 
was it the Lega K Raycast or right. their their perception modeling or whatever, make sure it all still works on that platform. Throw them in there and just kind of see how, from how there, it goes. From inside my mini Hogwarts stream. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, all right, well, let's, uh, I guess we'll let this upcoming hel helicopter live. See another day. So uh, maybe move on to Uncharted 3 real quick and just yeah. kind of check out some of the stuff going on in there. All right, so here we are in Uncharted 3, last Uncharted game on the PS3. Yes. Uh, you last were not actually on this game for the entirety of its development. No, I mean, I was on for the first year and then uh, got brought over uh, to do some really early work on Last of Us. Yes. Uh, but I did get to help out with uh, like this insanity <laughs> of, we have like buildings that fall over, but we found like the movement wasn't enough. Yeah. We want to like really just shake stuff just, up around. Just, just like give, you a, give you a floor that never stops moving. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So um, this presented a whole bunch of interesting problems and fun quirks to deal with. Yeah, so like what's what's going on here as I run around the ship, like what are you seeing in terms of systems interacting and like kind of work so, that had like, to well, be at, done at and stuff? The base of it obviously is uh, the ocean simulation that you see yeah. going on in the background where it's basically running Carlos's uh, ocean um, logic uh, to generate like these, you know, big, you know, waves that come in like dynamically. Mm. These, these are not like the amount of up and down here. This is all just coming from what's out of the water sim. Right. This is and not. So, this is not like somebody designed six waves that repeat in a pattern right. or anything like You're that. You're not going to see like repeating waves here, <laughs> or at least if you do. I'm looking. I, 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 I was scrutinizing these waves. Was like, if so, you see the repeating in the waves here, you, the NSA might want to have a chat <laughs> and maybe have a job for you. Yeah. So but, these swells, like all this stuff, is just yes. happening, right? Yeah. Okay. These are all just coming in naturally. And so the challenge number one is okay. We need this boat to be able to follow these swells. Okay, so, so the boat is in fact following the water simulation, like the boat is not hand yes. like animated to tilt back and forth? Right, Okay. Uh, with an asterisk. So, <laughs> okay. Well, so like the, the thing about this boat is it's a really big boat mm -hmm. and we can't have levels this big okay. in Uncharted. So, so the entire boat does not exist in memory all at one time? Exactly, Okay. but we need the boat's position on the water to be consistent, mm -hmm. right? So that as you move from one level to the other and as you load in the next area, like it, it's, they all get affected the same way by the water that's uh, driving this sort of larger simulation at play here. Yeah. So what we end up having is this kind of proxy where it is, think of it as like a sort of simplified model of this boat, like a giant box that just runs and its job is essentially just to model itself on the waves. Got it. And then all these levels that are placed here that represent the boats in different chunks those just attached to the proxy. Okay, so, so the box is actually what's following the water simulation and then the right. boat is following the box. Exactly, this is, yeah. Okay, yeah, layers so upon layers. So you have sort of this sort of like, it, like Shadow of the Colossus style, like thing that you need to like, you know, sort of attach yourself to but can only move through in sort of these narrow, narrowly constrained like perspectives. But it all has to sort of work together. And uh, yeah, the, the, this, this sort of big boat proxy thing was a, was a ended up being a pretty good solution for that. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, the, the motion of the boat doesn't actually, uh, you know, the character is not being jerked left and right, except in a few right. action scenes, you know, he's still standing still, but right. like... So this, like, even right now, what you see on screen here is, is there's a couple of interesting things happening. Like, one, like, you can see Drake's firmly planted on the boat, which means he's using that bound frame system I talked about in Uncharted 2. Okay. Sure, like, oh, he's actually parent to the boat. But we don't actually want, like, the the space of the world to be represented as the boat being the end all be all thing. So you can see how this barrel is rolling around. Uh -huh. It's not actually quote unquote parented to the boat. I need it's to, I, in world space. <laughs> I need to remind myself <laughs> that L two is not how you aim in this game. I played too much Uncharted four right before this. Uh, yeah, I'm this, sorry. I'm this, sorry. Go ahead. this thing is just following essentially like a more like world space model physics. Um, with asterisks, mm. but the idea is <laughs> a lot of asterisks. Yeah, I mean, like, well, like, so, like, this boat is going up some, potentially some really huge swells, Oop. and so the physics objects that are, let's say, not strictly apparent to the boat, you can end up with some interesting edge cases where, like, you like hear like maybe some like there's some like weird like banging going on down in the next room, and it turns uh, out just because the boat's rising and falling at 80 miles an hour, like some it's barrel slamming is, barrels up some against the ceiling along and the, stuff. Yeah. So like we have to like account for that in more subtle ways, but we still wanted to give this effect of like, okay, well, you know, this is not like a true like platform that you're binding yourself to. This is, it's kind of like sort of this half approximation. Right. So yeah, so it's like, 
Well, like you said, it's a real simulation with an asterisk, <laughs> like, or with some constraints placed on it, right? I mean, so much of like game development is like, like finding like the shortcuts you can take. Yeah. Uh, like, like how much and, can and, you like, fake and get away with it, kind of? Right. Like you want to like solve the problems that will make it like a better experience. So like having like Drake being able to like you know feel like he's super queasy on this boat and like these things have these platforms that are, you know, like you'll see here coming up like these uh, shipping containers that get shifted around because of like things that are happening in the environment like. That's all like really cool stuff with like fun gameplay, like uh, you know, okay. really fun the gameplay okay. behind it. Um, yeah, so you don't need to like solve it down to like a level that you know you wouldn't really have an appreciable benefit. Yeah. So much for stuff. Yeah, this this right here, you know, I played through this chapter right before we did this, and like this is uh, this is definitely the first instance of like wow, this motion is actually affecting how I relate to this game. You know, like these right. firefights, like yeah, like you know, this, this stuff is. Like that stuff, and then like all those things, they like AI needs to be able to be aware of them, cognizant of that stuff as uh, obstacles, and you know use them tactically for cover, all that stuff. And these are things that they did not exist, you know, you know, thirty seconds ago. Right now, they present as like these new places they can take cover. For right. example. Whoa. So yeah, I guess th this is a case where you actually start do you, you do start feeling it in the controls, you know, like the, like this this character is now no longer completely reliable in terms of how I want to move around and stuff. Yeah. Um, but I guess you. Oh gosh, I probably shouldn't try to melee an armor guy. Um, but I guess you have to you have to kind of like rein it in, right? Like, or you got to find a balance, I guess, right, between right. like playability and and like wanting it to look larger than life without it like affecting how you actually like grapple with what's happening, right? Yeah. yeah. Whoa, this is a bad place to be. You want to be able to tune for a good set of values. Right. And like so much instance, of like what you do as a gameplay programmer is making the systems that can have those kind of tuning interfaces just right. to begin with. Like I noticed that, uh, well, the moment just kind of passed, but like I noticed like the, the box that I took cover behind just now was not sliding around even though every other box on the deck was, you know? <laughs> Well, that one's kind of moving, but but you know I don't know if those are like considerations that you have to make every step of the way in terms of like how far do we take this? That guy down? I think so. I think he's down. Anybody else? You know Good. where to go here. Yes. For once <laughs> in the history of Uncharted, you just go through the door. <laughs> you just go through the exit. Um, so this is really cool here. Uh, yeah, I wanted to get to this part before we move on. This is the, uh, this is a separate water simulation uh, uh, running that's parented to the boat. Okay. But still reflecting, see like what I mean with these giant freaking swells. Right. Um, that itself is parented to the proxy, which itself is being driven by the ocean sim. It's, oh, it's so this freaking is, cool. So the swimming, the swimming pool water is following the boat, which is following the box, which is following the water. Yes. The ocean. Okay. Yes. Got it. Just add additional layers Marco. as needed. Marco. That's cool. Uh, <laughs> yeah, man, sad Drake. Yeah, nobody to play with. A pull for you. Today. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, is that stuff like that, like kind of hand tuned to happen at certain intervals, or like is I that believe, just a random? I thing? believe that is coming from the the ocean. Just, just random stuff. Yeah. That's cool. Uh, all right. Well, let's. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm gonna pop out to the main menu here. We're gonna skip ahead and, and look at just a little bit more stuff. Okay. Here in Uncharted 3. No. All right, things are happening in the hold here. <laughs> uh, it's a nice car. It was a nice car, sure. I don't think anybody's gonna be driving it out of here. <laughs> no. uh, so yeah, I mean, I, you know, I'm guessing this is kind of just applying a lot more of the, the same principles that you were talking about in the last chapter with. Yep. In, in the grand tradition of Naughty Dog never being satisfied with what we have, let's see if we can make it even more scary and terrifying <laughs> for us for programming front, yep. so let's have the boat tip over, flood it with water, and have the AI fight in that space. Right. Oof. So is, oh boy. Okay, I'm gonna try to ask questions and not get sniped at the same time, but, uh, wow, that's a lot of guys. Hang on, let me, let me whittle those down a little bit. Um, so, I mean, do you remember if, uh, is, is the water level, like, actually rising behind me? Like, yes. will this room just fill up if I, I mean, I guess we could just test that by <laughs> screwing around in here. Oh, I need a better gun. 
I'm out of grenades too. I, I want to say you're on the clock. All right, let's see if I can live through this. And then maybe we'll poke around in there a little bit. There you go, buddy. I should get that guy's gun while I can. Uh, oh God, yeah. Yep. That's, totally. <laughs> there's crap. a little bit more water. Wow. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, huh. I'm actually kind of tempted to just let this go and, and see what happens <laughs> if we just hang out in here and it goes very bad. <laughs> Uh, that's a bad place to be, buddy. I'll come up with a Drake-esque one-liner as I send these guys to a watery grave, but... I know Nathan Drake. Yeah, wow, huh? This really just goes at a certain point, doesn't yep. it? <laughs> okay. So, yeah. Again, not satisfied. Yes. Let's flip it. Yeah. Did that present any, like, weird challenges? Kind of having, like, you know, here's the surface you were wa walking on, and, like, now... Oh, yeah. That's a wall, yes. and, like... you've redefined gravity at this point, yeah. so... Uh, like, are you substituting in a different map at, at a certain point? No, or, actually, like, I think... I think we, might, we still might be doing the proxy trick at this point. Okay. Uh, we just move the proxy and then let the water sim settle as is. Yeah. Uh, because that... The internal non-ocean sim there, that I think that's always going to represent a consistent... What we consider the game to be... Down. Right. So to speak. Looks like uh, looks like maybe the water's kind of stabilized at this point. I mean, obviously, if you've got climbing stuff going on, you yes, I, I, assume, I think you're off the clock now. I assume I, I assume some... you want to let that breathe a little bit and yes. kind of give people a chance to poke around, and figure out where they need to go. Let's see. That looks climbable. Maybe. Yeah. Yellow? That might be worth a shot, or you can just Where's, tell me. Game. Oh, maybe you had to shoot that thing out? Oh, there's something to shoot here. We did the, not actually. The thing? Is, what's that? No. It's been a very long time since I played this game, and we didn't have time to check out this chapter beforehand. Yeah, just go up there. Let's go up this way. That's Yeah, that was my original plan. Oh, nope. There's that jump. That's a thing you can't climb on. Nope, not for that. Yep. Uh, anyway, I mean, you know, I think this, this probably illustrates the point pretty well that you kind of like solve these hard problems and oh wait is that where I need to go over here? You don't. And then kind of like find ways to further. Uh, there's probably just some treasure back there that you missed, but ah, we, we yeah. won't we won't mind. Ah, uh, you know, I've there's, I've I've missed a few treasures in my uncharted career. I'll have to work on that. Uh, I think that that'll be okay. <laughs> That's right. Okay, yeah, I remember yes. a lot of this stuff. Yeah, like there's just a, there's a whole lot of up is down, you know, left left is right kind of stuff going right. on in here. Uh, I don't know how much of a challenge that was on the engineering side, or, you know, like at a certain point you're just building a level that just looks like it's... Mm. No? <laughs> Not so much? This, this, this cruise ship was a lot of work. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just because so much of it was, like, had this sort of intermediate proxy steps, like things... That breaks a lot of assumptions that you typically might build inside your engine. Or, like, the way things can... The rules for things applying affects other things, that right. kind of stuff. Just kind of, this is this is not a use case that we accounted for when we designed the yep. stuff to begin with. Right. Uh, all right, well, I don't know if, uh, you know, it's, it's very wet in here. <laughs> I'm feeling like maybe we should, we might want to move on before we drown. Let this hallway fill up, flood up a little bit. Okay. It's how, I mean, how, how acute are your memories of this stuff? Does this all just like, does every inch of this stand out in your memory as like, oh god, that was... For three, this is, it's things, moments like this. This yeah. is the one. This one and the uh, the cargo plane. Yeah. The, the zero-g effects that we had to do. Right, for right, the, yes. That stuff. But then, yeah, like, this was like a big... Pushing us on how, what we could do with like the water sim and like the water effects and the way like it sort of floods and fills out. And, yeah. Like, Very yeah. Titanic. Yes. Here. Um, like, we... We got a lot of we got a lot of mileage out of uh, Charlie's water sim here. Yeah, that's, that's nice looking water to this yeah. day. It's good stuff. Good job, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> Bravo, and Carlos. Yeah, all you guys. Uh, all right, well, uh, that's that's a quick look at your your time with Uncharted Three, uh, or in a lot of people's time, I should say. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's maybe move on to one more thing real quick before we call this a day. One real quick. What do you yeah. say? Sure. All right, cowboy. <sighs> Resisting the urge to indulge in some kind of <laughs> yippee ki -yay humor here, but uh, your wife is laughing off camera, which makes me very happy. Rope and ride? Uh, Let's do it. 
<laughs> but uh, yeah, like we would be remiss if we didn't work a little Uncharted 4 in here just, just to kind of come full circle and yeah. just say like, man, look how fucking far this stuff has come. It, uh, it, is, it is interesting for me just to see that all put together back to back like this. Yeah. Like, yeah, even for me, uh, and I, you know, I, I'm, I have way less personal connection to the stuff than you do, but like, yeah. just seeing it all like end to end, you know, like it's pretty eye opening. Was that entire cutscene? So like, we talked about that a little bit in, I think when we were maybe looking at two with the train stuff, but like, that question of like, what's a cutscene? What's what's FMV? What are they faking? And what is actually real? Like, you made it sound like this. That's it's not fake. That's, most, most of this game is real from the sound of it. Yes. Yeah. That is. Uh, all our engine running in real time. Yeah, those, so those getting, character scenes. Getting those faces, getting those animations, like, it's, I, my favorite thing about working at Naughty Dog has been being able to create the tools that we use to empower, like, animators to come up with stuff, mm -hmm. designers to come up with crazy stuff. I mean, we saw that progression with, like, how they took the stuff from Uncharted 2, they made, like, this big collapsing building from it, then they took it, they made the shipwreck. Mm -hmm. Like, the animation tools that we can give our guys to, like, allow them to, like, tell a more nuanced story, to yeah. tell something that, you know, just has, like, just a more richness to it. Yeah. It, it makes me really happy. It's a, it's a totally. very, like, sort of professionally satisfying aspect of working at Naughty Dog for me is being able to, like, Say I help uplift the team in some way right, with right. like my small contribution. That's there treasure I didn't get. This video has all been worth it. There it is. Um, yeah, like not to uh, you know not to blow smoke up the collective posterior of your studio, uh, but we talked about this some like in the quick look for this and the, as it came out like this was the game at least in this series and kind of broadly like this was the game where. I stopped marveling at how good the facial animation had gotten and just started like believing it, you know? Like I kind of stopped thinking about it because I was like, they emote well enough now that I can just like, you know, like kind of subconsciously you just absorb their performance and get what they're doing uh, without going like, those are really good video game characters, you know? Like they're just right. good characters now. Uh, and There's yeah, like, so much like skin deformation going on, like the, 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 the things that the, our character TDs put together to like make that stuff come alive so that, you know, an animator can come in and like, Give a smile that is like me, both subtle and effective. It's, yeah. uh, and, and I get to like make sure that you know animates well when, you right. when, it, when it comes time. And like it's kind of going on here, even you know, like you, there's no. I, I don't think there's a way to manipulate the camera unless I went into the photo mode to like zoom all the way in on them. But like if you kind of squint, you can sort of see the faces doing their thing. You know, yeah. <laughs> even even when like you're viewing it from behind and like they're pulled, what the camera's pulled way out, like it's still they like they they're consistent across the board, you know? Like, it, it seems like just, just throughout the entire game they're doing their thing. Who made these uh, Must be a this was also an area where, like, it just Even drove I home to me, like, how sharp this game looks. I mean, from yeah. a, in, in a literal sense, like, even way off in the distance with the details and stuff, like, there's a, you know, and, you know like, you can go read the Digital Foundry breakdown if you want about the, the anti-aliasing and stuff, but, like, mm -hmm. just there's just an image quality to this area that's, like, super striking. I think it does, to like, me. It has that effect that, for me of just like putting you in this space where it feels like, okay, you're sort of out there in the open now. You have this space for adventure. Go explore. Yeah. Like just being able to put all the pieces in place, both technically, artistically, you know, narratively, and have it like come over that hill. Like that was, that was like when I got to do that for myself for the first time. It was like, okay, this is fucking great. Yeah, it's this cool. Is, like, this is nice. If anything, it's like it's it's like the one thing I almost wish there was more of in this game. You know, it's just like this this nice casual little little interlude. You know, of just like oh, let's you know let's work a little exposition in here and you yep. can just kind of drive around and have fun. And there's like a, you know there's a well you can jump down at one point and like a couple other caves to explore and mm -hmm. like it's just mm -hmm. it's just nice. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and you know like we we talked about this off camera a little bit and it sounds like you know a, a, a good bit of what it what came together to make this game happen is kind of iterative based on what happened with the previous games. I mean, we're always trying uh, to like, you know, take the lessons we, we you know, we, sure. we, we uh, learned from the last game's ambitions that maybe we didn't have a chance to get to and, you know, see what we can do, see what we can push it with. Oh boy. And so, uh, for me, like, one of the things I worked on for this was a way to like, have the AI like 
be able to navigate and represent the space in a way that, you know, would scale up to these kind of large environments that they said they wanted to do. In, in terms of the, like the combat encounters, or well, just in terms of their ability to represent like where they are in the world. And, oh, just navigating it and navigating, just, getting, it. just, just finding right. their way around. Right. So, like, we use something called the nav map uh, in, on the PS3, which, if you were to look at sort of the sort of low res triangle space that represented where they could navigate, uh -huh. the nav map was that essentially rasterized. And, uh, which was made into like sort of a 2D bitmap image. And then like you could figure out all your navigation, okay. you know, uh, dynamic obstacles and stuff could be go. rasterized into that as well. And then do your pathfind in there. Uh, so it was a good way to really Step solve inside. like this, like, you know, you have this crate that slides around on the ship deck. So you need to know like, okay, well you can't actually walk through that space now, even though like the static representation hasn't really changed. Um, but we wanted to do more than that. We wanted to have like, you know, like the role, the problem with the nav map is that it's really small in terms of like the space it can represent where dynamic obstacles exist. And so like when you try and scale up to environments this size, one of the problems that can happen is like you won't know about an, like a, a box that landed in your way until you actually, you know, get into a space where it's now rasterized as part of your own local nav map. Mm -hmm. We needed to be able to reason about dynamic obstacles in a more global sense and, and, a, uh, and being able to construct your path or an NPC to know like, okay, well, I don't actually want to, you know, hop down this path. I need to go the long way around here because of this thing that's in the, in the way. So uh, what I got to do was come up with a way to actually dynamically <laughs> intersect and tessellate that nav mesh with any kind of uh, navigation obstacles. And that, that really opened us up to like have, you know, more organic spaces, more wide open spaces. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, a, there's a part later on in the game where you're basically fighting on a series of these like plateaus that are connected from by jumps and being able to like have the AI reason about that uh, and kind of in, intuitively in know how to get through it and itself. not not be confused that when they get somewhere that something they didn't know about previously is going to like confound them um, which obviously I guess that you know that gives you a way more robust solution to the problem than having someone like hand animate a character going through that stuff oh yeah no we want them to be able to uh, at all times like be able to like figure out like okay like here's like you know a good place for me to fight not just like this is always going to be the place I fight. Right. Like there are like, you know, places where like for a narrative sense, like, okay, we need you to like defend this doorway or something. So like they'll take up positions around it, but they, they do so in, you know, a more tactical way. Mm -hmm. um, something that can take into account like all the environmental analysis that we're doing with like ray casts and stuff. Too bad. Uh Bad you can't convince Sam to hop out and follow you around here a little bit because I know that I know that you worked on a lot of the stuff that Sam dictates. Sam is very lazy. Very lazy. <laughs> he likes to take a load off yeah. once in a while. You know, he enjoys the finer things in yeah. life. Uh, but yeah, you know, I, I know that. Uh, yeah, I do a lot of character animation uh, work. Right. Um, a lot of it's like built around the NPC. Some of it, you know, can help out with the player. But the you know, player guys, they they know their stuff. Uh, but yeah, like just making them look good when they're like navigating from point A to point B. Um, you know, when they're in cover, when they're interacting with environment objects, like these are a lot of things I um, I work on. Getting shot, mm -hmm. getting shot's a big one because you always want that to feel really satisfying. Right. Um, so I uh, I work with some just really top shelf animators, uh, uh, Michael Mock and, and the Amadina, who uh, will pull this stuff together and like take like like systems I've written in the DC language I talked about and and you know flesh out like a character, um, uh, you know, for locomotion, for hit reactions, for cover, and, and just when, having that coordination, having that like, when things really come together, it's always like super satisfying. Right. Ten zillion little details you need to add to the game that yes. nobody yeah. notices any of them individually, but they all add up, right? Right, right. Uh, and then like the curse of like making something like this is like I never stop noticing those ten zillion little things. Right. <laughs> and how and how yes. you want to do them better like, the next nope, time. That could that could be better. Like, yep. nope, we can fix that. Well yep. if there's one thing we can be sure of, it's that the pants still get wet. Yes, thank God. Uh, Drake, Drake can still wet his pants. <laughs> <laughs> that that's still working as intended for sure. <laughs> uh, all right, well, cowboy, thank you very much for stopping by. Uh, this has been a, a fun little. Uh, yeah, this you know, has been. This has been. This little walk down a, a very yeah. a highly technical walk down memory lane. Yeah, I've, you know, uh, sort of mulling it over my time in iDog and, and and just every, how far we've come and what we've been able to do and yeah. it's it uh, it feels good to uh, 
to see this all come together like this yes. and makes me really excited for you know more challenges more craziness what, what, more stuff what, that we want to do what the future holds for sure yeah yeah yeah, yeah. you guys have definitely done a bang up job so far so uh, thank you we, we look forward to what's it. next thank you Brad yep